In the beginning was the womb, the infinite eternal womb, from which arose the universe and the stars, space and time themselves. And as the fruits of the earth emerged, the flora, the fauna, and the human race, they brought with their emergence the realization, the truth. In the beginning was the womb, and the womb was woman, and she was Anahita, begetter of existence. Anahita, the spirit of the waters, the bringer of wisdom and justice. I span the universe. My silhouette causes the tide. The moon rises, the day subsides. Son of man, who gave you birth? Who set free the fecundity of earth? She who nurtured nature's need. She is the vessel and the sea. History has been blind to the faith of womankind. I am Anahita, the spirit of Aphrodite. All powerful, all mighty. The books, they say there was a fall. Yes, man in that first Eden spread a lie that he was all. A new truth emerges and says, that is not true. What good is man's seed without a womb in which to grow? Now, in every reckoning decades too late, a sort of justice alters the faith of the women of India. A law to restore a partial dignity, not an evening of the score. Take the volumes of suffering down from the shelves. Let the women speak for themselves. in a young girl's fortune I had a presentable man a little older but keeping in his stars and modest ambition soon to be a successful business his bookshop the college boys and girls they came the officers and soldiers of the British Indian Army the Mamesars who would browse the shelves for love poetry and mostly for 
cheap detective novels, bodice rippers as they call them. I had two children and fell pregnant with a third. I insisted on working till the last days of my pregnancy and felt the contractions while I was serving a customer at the bookshop with the book Mary Corley's Sorrows of Satan. My husband went and got a taxi and we drove straight to Dr. Bhandarwala's nursing home. Six hours later, my baby boy was born. My beautiful baby boy was born. Yes, beautiful. And as I was feeding him, my mother-in-law walked into the room and sat by my side, smiling. But soon, her smile turned into a frown. What is this baby, she said. It's up to my husband to name him, I said. She took my baby, plucking my nipple from its guts and staring at it said, it has blue eyes and golden hair, my mother-in-law said. Yes, she called my child it. He is beautiful, I said. He is not ours, she said. And turning to my husband said, Have you seen what this has produced. She spat at me and walked out of the room. My husband followed. No one visited me. Three days later, I took my baby boy in a rickshaw and went home. I found two suitcases on the doorstep with my clothes in it. My older son came to the door and said I wasn't to come in. I was turned away. I had nowhere to go. I went to my brother's house, but his doors were barred for me. His wife came to the door when I knocked and said I wasn't welcome there. My brother followed me out into the street and without a word thrust some money into my hands and then walked away. I called out to him, Jamshed Bhai, Jamshed Bhai, but he did not look back. I found myself a job as an assistant in a shoe shop and lived off its meager earnings with my little baby, but there was one surprise. For four years after he was born, every month, or perhaps two, an envelope would be slipped under my door with some rupees in it. I assumed it was from my brother. But I never got a chance to thank him or even to face him. Then independence came and the gifts. They suddenly stopped when my son, whom I had named Gustav, grew to the age of eight. I paid a Parsi priest to induct him into the faith. He would have a Naujot ceremony and prove to the world that he was of the race and blood and religion. The day of the Naujot arrived and the priest came in the late afternoon. As the first notes of the chanted prayer rang out, there was a cry from an angry crowd outside. I went to the door and pulled aside the curtains. There was an angry mob 
led by my husband, who wanted to denounce the ceremony and possibly prevent it from going ahead. The family that owned the shop felt a hostility in the air and left for Israel. They closed their business and left for Israel. They left me nothing, and no one would employ me at that age. Then began the era of begging and starvation. Waiting at the doors of compassionate neighbors who would invite me in for a meal and spare my shame on certain days of the week. I thought of theft to keep my boy in bread. But what if I was caught? What would become of him? I went to Parsi charities and after a few days the trustees heard of my disgrace and withdrew their support. Still, I put him through college and through the exams of the Indian Administrative Service, for which he scored the highest. He was sent to America on a trade mission and never came back. He embraced Christianity in the USA and became an evangelical. Born again. He was so in need of a second birth. And now, what must I confess? What regret. Yes, I remember that day. He was called Lieutenant Cosgrove. Yes, I remember. He was in charge of the regimental library and would come in regularly to order books, mostly magazines. We'd make lists. And that was a hot day. I saw nothing wrong in going out for a picnic in his jeep. My husband trusted me. What's more, it would result in a lot of orders in books. I remember drinking champagne by the river, the trees spinning, the current and Cosgrove's voice soft. I remember drinking champagne by the river and the current, the breeze, the tree spinning and Cosgrove's voice soft. My womb become my albatross. Could not the fruit of my womb become my savior had my son been accepted into the faith? Bakhtavar Patel, 
They call me Bucky and variations of that name. I'm a lawyer by trade. And before you mistake the name Patel to be a Parsi Zoroastrian one, let me tell you that it's my husband's name. And he's a Hindu, though not a very pious, practicing one. My children are confused, but I've taught them the Parsi prayers. I must start by saying that though I address you as a petitioner, I do not recognize you as any sort of court having any authority over anybody. As a citizen of India, as you are also, you are subject to the law of the land and none other. You may fancy yourself as some sort of Zoroastrian Sharia court, but of course, that's nonsense. Doesn't care about anything, lawyer. Bante model chani lage cha. I've come here, nevertheless, to address you on a sort of public relations exercise. The government of this country has issued for debate to bring the entire country under a uniform and unified civil code. As a woman and a Parsi, I support the proposal. I no longer want Hindu women to be treated as inferior to their brothers. I no longer want Muslim women to be divorced at the whims of their husbands or suffer the humiliation of sharing a bed with three extras in a marriage, so to speak. I told you their father is a Hindu. And even though my children used to come with me to the Parsi fire temple for years, last week, the new young arrogant priest barred them from entry. He stood at the doorway and when they showed him the sticks of sandalwood they had got as offerings, he told them he did not allow polluted hands to make offerings to the holy fire. Can you believe it? Does anyone in this day and age claim that their religion requires them to burn widows on the funeral pyres of their husbands? Does anyone believe in marrying off their daughters at the age of three to be subject to the whims and cruelty of some grown man and his mother? Yes, I know. People kill each other in the thousands in the name of religion, even in our world, and in a division of religion. But do we want to live in such a world? My approach to you is to use whatever superstitious authority you have to weigh in on the side of the law. Take a step to emancipate this country. Get that silly priest to allow my children to the house of prayer. And if I can't do it with the backing of the law, I will do it with the backing of hysteria, to which, according to the world of men, we women are prone. And is hysteria the weapon of the eagle fighting with flailing wings and deafening screeches, the cat which has trapped it in its mouth? I know, he said. The meek shall inherit the earth. Women have been the weaker, meeker sex and will now make the prophecy come true. We shall claim the earth through our arguments, through our minds, through the force of our bodies. We shall cease to be the inadequate yin of the yang. The law of Anahita, the womb of the universe, will own all that it has engendered.